Hi. Oh my God. Wow. 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 Weren't those amazing films? That was just so incredible. And we are so happy to have some of the filmmakers with us today. So, um, but first we'd like to introduce you to tonight's moderator. Um, Karen Herman is our dear friend and mentor. Uh, she's the former vice president and chief curator of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. And before joining the Rock Hall, Karen served as the vice president of the Archive of American Television at the Television Academy here in Hollywood. Um, we would not be where we are today if it weren't for Karen teaching us the craft of interviewing. So we are forever in her debt. So please welcome to the stage Karen Herman and some of the filmmakers from the films you just watched. And if you have questions for the filmmakers, drop them in the Q&A. Please. Hi, what a nice introduction, uh, Amy and Nancy, and thank you so, so much. And I just want to thank, first of all, hello everyone for joining us tonight. Um, especially the thank you to Amy and Nancy for putting on the Power Past and Nisos Summit. Um, this is um, the third year and it's just uh, the first two have been fantastic and I'm sure this one's going to be even better. Um, so I'm delighted to have you here this evening. Each year Lunafest uh, puts on the spotlight on the work of, on the work of diverse uh, array of filmmakers and this is my third year of moderating so I'm very excited because um, each year these films get better and better and um, it's just the, the messages are just so incredible. Um, so, so what I'd like to do actually is start um, and, and have each of the panelists, the filmmakers today, uh, give us a just a brief introduction um, who you are, the film you just <laughs> we just saw. And um, the question, the first question I want to ask all of you is um, what is the most passionate thing for you about filmmaking? What brought you here and um, what is your passion about it? Um, we'll start with uh, Catherine. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, for me, I grew up uh, kind of working at the intersection of art and activism. I worked for a nonprofit that worked on violence against women and girls uh, for about 10 years before I got into filmmaking. Um, so filmmaking for me is a way to kind of use an art form that appeals to the masses to hopefully tell a story that um, can also live at that intersection. Um, yeah, that's what drew me to it. That's great. Um, how about um, Andrea? Hi, uh, my name no, is Andrea. Okay. Go on. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I'm Andrea. I'm the filmmaker who made How to Be at Home. And uh, I love that question. Um, I think for me, filmmaking is about collaboration. I love that it's an art form that takes a lot of people and has a lot of different steps. And it, uh, I love the, the process. Um, every time I make a film, it feels like I go on a journey. And even though I might have something in something my mind, in my mind. Uh, that, I, that I think might happen, it's always a surprise. And uh, I love that. I love that it um, brings people together and it brings an audience together in the end to see it. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, how about you, Sharon? Uh, almost like what Andrea said, um, for me, I'm most passionate about the people um, from my community who has continued to support me over the years and have allowed me to continue to make films. Um, to the crew that comes together each time, like in Andrea's film where it said, uh, thinking about all the people that came together to make this film, that's always so inspiring. And then just being with an audience and listening to them interact with it. So for me, I mean, people have really powered me um, through every step of the filmmaking process. Oh, that's great. And how about you, Hunter? And oh my gosh, that smile at the end of that film is just the best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, for me, I think it's, uh, well, this was my, my first film that I really participated in, um, to make, um, and I'm really lucky that it's about myself. Um, and so I guess for me, it would be just visualizing, um, my life and dreams, which a lot of people, um, do in film. Um, and it's a great, it's a great form of doing so. That's great. And Shalise? Thanks. Um, I, 
I agree. What Andrea and Sharon both said really was resonating with me as well. I think there's a, a gift to being able to do this work where you can get paid or sometimes not paid, but um, to work with others, to um, invite stories. But also I think there's an opportunity. I noticed while I was watching these films today, I mean, I, I cried and laughed through so many of them. And I think the experience of feeling so deeply as an audience, but also all of the journeys that we take with one another during the filmmaking process with our colleagues in filmmaking, with participants in the film, I feel like this work allows me to go really deep with people and often with people that I didn't know before um, in a way that feels really special. Yeah, that's great. It's so collaborative. I think it's really interesting too. Um, maybe you and Hunter can talk about how did you guys, how did you guys meet? How did this come about? I mean, um, Akanksha, yeah. did you get to talk about, you did at the beginning, oh, right? Oh, I'm sorry. No, um, no, yeah, no, no. I'm sorry, Akanksha. Oh, uh, it's okay. Um, yeah, for me, it's, I think it's the storytelling aspect of it. Okay, so let's go back. I want to go back to the question with Chalice and Hunter, and um, we're going to talk about all of your films too. Um, but uh, again, how did that how did that come about? Um, so Hunter and I met through a mutual friend um, who does really incredible work here in Los Angeles in the queer community um, with a, a project called Project Q. Um, Hunter may be able to say a little bit more. Um, and the project was commissioned by California Humanities as part of a larger series on California youth and really centering the voices of young people in California and the issues that are important to them. Um, and the goal of the project was to bring filmmakers and young people who had, who were telling their own stories together to collaborate on, um, on short films. Um, and so I was really fortunate to be introduced to Hunter and um, I was introduced because Hunter's artwork is incredibly powerful and his um, journals was something that he had shared with other people. Um, and then we worked together over a long period of time to figure out how to bring this story, the visuals um, into a broader story. Oh, that's really cool. Was 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 animation always a part of it? Um, we, um, our, we had originally known that we wanted to to use animation, but the process of that, how that animation looked, and and the process of building it was something that we all learned throughout the process. Oh, okay, um, Sharon, can you talk a little bit about about your autobiographical experiences in the film? Uh, yes, I, I used to clean houses with my mom growing up um, as early as the days when Teddy Ruxpin toys were around. Um, and I remember that, uh, that that I still have a memory of me holding this toy and just like wanting it so badly. <laughs> um, and, but it belonged to our client's daughter. And um, I, I just, I feel like a lot of times I would compare, like I said in my intro, compare the things I had. But I grew up, I um, eventually started cleaning houses myself on my own um, when I was closer to, when I was attending community college, like over the weekends, I was cleaning houses. And um, I feel like it's a, a point of view that may, not maybe not many people have experienced to to be a person who cleans someone else's house that, that isn't in your family or, or you know, your, your nuclear circle. So I feel very uh, privileged to be able to have told this story um, because usually someone else is telling the cleaning person's story, right? And I feel like I might be one of the few or the first that has actually been able to tell their own story. Well, why, why do you think that is? Um, maybe accessibility. Um, it, it's been a journey to get to where I am right now. And I know that I've uh, been able to rise above a bunch of odds, um, not only being a woman, but being Latina. Um, you know, we were 
uh, also, like I mentioned in the intro, you know, we would sell tacos on some mornings to make some income and then we'd go clean houses as well. So piecing together all that income, um, there wasn't really um, the idea of like, oh, you know, now I'm going to be able to raise a ton of money to make a bunch of films like that didn't quite fit into the calculations for um, for our like what what we the resources that we have yeah and i imagine that's a lot of people's stories <laughs> film school yeah, who, else can, yeah. Who, who else can speak to that no one that's not an issue <laughs> or do you not want to say i mean i i know even really successful filmmakers that struggle financing their films to this day with their careers already at a point where they are so uh, you can only imagine someone who's just trying to break into the industry and then someone who's coming from a very under-resourced place so there, there are definitely a lot of a lot more hurdles um throughout but it's already a very um a very difficult industry regardless of what background you're from yeah yeah how, how do you guys think um you know COVID has impacted it i mean you know when you were doing your films you know how is it different now most of you have have done films before how is it different for you um during this period Does anyone take that? Do you want to take it? I mean, I, I just uh, wrapped production on something in February, and our our COVID uh, numbers just made the budget just go up. And at any moment, uh, we, we could have just had to shut down because we were testing constantly. And um, sometimes we would even do last minute rapid testing, and it was like the most stressful 15 minutes of the day because we were just like, if anybody tests, uh, positive at any point, like that's it, <laughs> you know, like what are we going to do next? So um, it definitely made our budgets balloon. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it added a, a, that new variable to the budget. Yeah, I think, uh, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Karen. No. I mean, I think in, in my experience, I think the looking at the in in so many ways, there was a lot of creativity that came out of that period. I think Andrea's film speaks so much to like what's possible um, in in smaller teams and um, using tools that don't require in person um, filming. Uh, but I also think it really raised this question of the pressure to to make films and to make films with larger budgets. I also work for larger production companies, and I think. Er, certainly early on, there was this question of when do we come back? And once people came back, how to keep people safe? And really, as with any other work um, during this time, thinking about what it means to, to consider the most vulnerable among us in the work that we're doing. Um, and so I, I think that it both led to a lot of creativity and also a lot of pressure when you know, schedules and budgets were not necessarily um, as flexible as we would like them to be. Right, right. And Andrew, your film was specifically, you know, about this experience. Can you talk about that? How that how that came about for you? Yeah, sure. And and uh, I can also connect it a little bit to um, what Sharon was talking about as well. Um, so I made a film ten years before How to Be at home called How to Be Alone. And it was a similar collaboration with the poet Tanya Davis. And uh, and that film really resonated with many people. You can actually see it on, on YouTube. It's um, It went viral and uh, it was one of those poems. Tanya, the poet, is a brilliant, brilliant um, poet. And uh, it was one of those poems that really resonated. So when COVID happened, um, we had a lot of people say, oh, I love that poem, How to Be Alone. But so many of the things that you suggest doing are going to the library, going to a cafe, going to the movies, and now we're stuck at home. So that was where the idea was born of doing sort of a, a sequel in a way or, or a, new, um, a new vision of the idea of being alone but also being separate and uh, in our, our sort of silos, that is what happened in COVID. So that was the idea. 
Um, of course, uh, I didn't need a crew. It was really just me in this room where I'm talking to you right now. I spent um, three months in the room making the poem. So as far as COVID, uh, I mean, it really kind of worked out in a sense. I didn't need many resources. I didn't need, you know, like most of it was just old books I had lying around um, is what I animated in. And I, and so I used what I had. Um, but just going back to what Sharon was talking about, one of the reasons why I ever decided to do animation in the first place, and I'm a self-taught animator, is because filmmaking was just too expensive. It was too hard to raise the funds. And, and I had made a feature film. I mean, it's funny because I made feature films, but then went back to short films and then went to animation because I just realized, well, I could do everything myself and I didn't necessarily need to find you know, all of the money that I was having to look for to do uh, um, feature films. So like many people, most people in filmmaking, I'm there also for the stories, for the storytelling. And I'm always trying to find ways to make stories creatively within the resources that I have. Although I would love to make bigger budget films, um, they're really hard. You know, it's sort of the, I always say it's the marathon of of filmmaking to make a, a feature film or a live action film, but I love animation and I love the the flexibility and um, and creativity of it. So how long did it take you? Were you working you know every day you know twelve hours? I mean, what was the the timing on that? No, I would never work twelve hours. Like I think that would be really hard. <laughs> um, but it was. I'm in. So I don't know if anybody knows where I am. I'm in Nova Scotia, Canada. And uh, so it's probably not as hot as where some of you are in the States. So I, I made it from between June and September of 2020, right at like in the midst of the lockdown period. And of course, at that time, we all thought it was going to magically go away. So I was like, is this film even going to be relevant? Like, I don't know, maybe this is going to be so past tense by the time I'm done. But of course, what we didn't know is that was really just the beginning of the pandemic. And now we're still in some version of it years later. But uh, it took probably three months. And then I would spend maybe five hours a day working on it. Uh, I mean, that's sort of all I could. I mean, it's pretty anybody who's done animation. Um, knows it's it's pretty intense and you know you're working with little materials and uh, I needed to just get out of the room oh yeah what I was going to say is the room got very hot because it's a small room it's about eight by four or six by four and it has um, like lights and then just a small window that you can't see so uh, it was kind of it got to a point where it was like uh, this is not healthy to do <laughs> so mm -hmm. I took lots of breaks Shalise, I see you nodding. Uh, on this. Did you guys have similar experiences? Yeah, I just maybe Hunter wants to speak to the process of creating the artworks for our film. This is the first film I've made entirely in animation. Um, I think we all learned a lot. None of us came to this with that experience or professionalism. And I think Hunter's um, process of, of evolving his own artwork for this process was pretty interesting to me. Hunter, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I uh, because we originally were going to just go based off of my journals, which is nice. But the more and more that we developed it, um, uh, the more and more we um, I was just ending up drawing um, the aspects for the film. And and um, the more that we the more that I drew, um, the more that my art style um, evolved just to kind of um, to be more consistent. And that's something that uh, I've always struggled with um, really doing. And now when I do art um, for myself these days, um, I still kind of have that um, similar art style from the film, but um, it, it definitely gave me a lot of new techniques that I didn't have before. And just to also mention that Hunter drew every single element in the film. So each car, each palm tree, each, um, you know, piece of furniture, um, in many cases, those were all drawn individually and then 
were created, a universe was created from those elements. So the the labor, the artistic labor that went into to the making of the film was really um, pretty epic. That's really, really cool. I understand there's a question from the audience. I, um, there should be a question popping up. There we go. <laughs> Lisa V, was there something from any of the other uh, filmmaker projects that really resonated with you personally? That's a great question, Lisa. Um, who wants to take it first? I, I just wanted to say, oh, sorry. Oh, oh no, no, go. No. <laughs> Wait, who's this? Who's go? Um, uh, well, I was, I was actually- Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say lie. that Hunter's um, film, uh, I really loved it. Um, I thought the animation was just gorgeous and colorful. And um, and now that I know that you actually made every single one of those elements, that is a, a huge feat. Um, but I also think that yeah, I have a lot of people in my life right now who are at that age and who are also queer. And I, I think that to have um, that sort of, that role model of, of uncertainty and yet the vulnerability of moving forward in life is just such an amazing example of, I mean, I don't think anybody really ever feels like a grown up in the sense that we don't really arrive anywhere, but just to be on that precipice and the story of, uh, of somebody who's taking that step with courage. And I just, I love the last line of the film. It was, it was perfect. Anyone else want to take the question? I know Sharon, you were going to say something before. Oh, no, I was pointing at, at everyone else. <laughs> but, but I do have an answer to this. There were two things that um, I, I was actually taking notes from uh, some of the films because there was just these little sound bites that um, were just amazing. Um, and one of them was uh, from the comic, uh, and I know she's not here right now, but it said representation is important, but misrepresentation has a real human cost. That was that was just such a powerful statement. And then um, for the the hat, Tracy's hats, um, just the line that said, "What you do will comfort will give comfort to someone who's looking for answers." Um, that was also really moving. Um, but I also really connected with a proof of life because I lost my house. One of our houses, we we lost it to a house fire. And right now the film that I'm working on has to do with losing home. And um, I saw some similarities to, to some of the things that I've explored and some, I really liked that visual of the, the house, the, the actual um, house at the end and, and the song that you closed with. So that was, that was great. Yeah. Um, Hunter, did you want to say something too before? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say with um, with Sharon's film specifically, I, I resonate, resonated with that one a lot just because um, my mom, um, and she still does, takes a lot of cleaning jobs on the side for, for income. And so um, growing up um, just kind of um, in environments where full of wealthy people, especially because we would clean for wealthier people. Um, I definitely resonated with a lot of that film. So I just wanted to say, I really like that one. Oh, they're, they're also good. Um, Catherine, I do have a question for you. You had said in the book, at the introduction of your film, um, that, you know, it's about holding multiple truths at the same time, which I thought was just oh, so incredible. And I thought the film did that so, so, so well. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, was that always part of, you know, what you, what you were trying to do? It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wasn't the writer. Laura Zach is the writer <clears throat> and the producer. And we worked together on what the story would be. And that was kind of the, the linchpin of, of everything that we wanted to kind of build around in the context of, you know, the environment and the, the situation happening up in Santa Rosa when we were shooting. Um, but that really was the crux of it. How do we show that in a subtle and nuanced way while also kind of, um, you know, with, with short films, you're really just kind of dropped in to a moment, you know, a, a 10, 15 minute moment in these people's lives. And so it was, it was kind of a challenge for us to figure out how to 
show the kind of duality and show what it looks like to hold those truths um, without it being kind of, you know, beating you over the head with anything either. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, the story was based off of a feeling and a, a memory, a, a, re, a, a story that I had personally, um, not related to fire is actually a, about a friend of mine who uh, went through an experience where she lost her husband. And then a year later, she was going to a party uh, that they would have gone to together. And she got into a car accident, ended up in a river. And she was dealing with, she survived, she, but she battled with this idea that had he survived um, his heart attack a year prior, he would have been in that car uh, and she wouldn't have been able to save him. Uh, so she was struggling with this idea of, you know, being grateful um, to be alive, uh, being grateful even that he had died uh, and it wasn't her fault. Uh, but how do you kind of hold those two things together? So that was kind of the the crux of the, the feeling of what we wanted to go for uh, in the context of the fires. Wow. Wow. Really great. I understand there's another question uh, coming in. Carolyn Kay, what is the process you go through as you submit uh, to LunaFest and how many other festivals or what festival circuits, circuits are you all part of? You want to take it first? I can, I can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I probably speak for, for most people here. There's, um, I use Film Freeway, but there's there's multiple different ways to submit to festivals. Um, and for me, it was just finding festivals that resonated kind of with with the kind of storytelling um, that I wanted, that I was making, but also that I wanted to be a part of in terms of the curation of the festivals. So LunaFest is one um, that I think has been doing amazing work for many years, uh, and it's really just about submitting and, and hopefully getting um, accepted. Um, but the circuit itself, you know, has been, you know, a two year process for me anyway and I have actually still yet to see proof of loss in front of an audience um, just because it's been entirely on the festival circuit during COVID um, but yeah it's 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 really just kind of looking through the festivals what feels right for your film uh, and submitting it in whatever way they accept submissions uh, and then working with those um, programmers to to kind of hopefully you know get accepted and then and then you know take part in whatever uh, screenings or whatever that they allow. Does anyone else want to uh, add on to that? Yeah, I can add on. Um, we So with when you clean a stranger's home, most of our festival circuit was during uh, the last couple years of in the virtual world. Um, but at the end of last year, we actually got a distribution with HBO and the film is now available on HBO Max if you all want to spread the word about it. Um, and it will continue to tour with LunaFest for the next couple of months as well. Um, the film that I shot in February, um, the festival circuit for that will begin next year, hopefully in January, but um, definitely at some point in 2023. So look out for that too. What's it called? Oh, it's called In Tow, I-N-T-O-W. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is that is that also a short a short film as well? Yes, it's a, a short film. This one was more of a video essay, but that one is um, it's a, a it's a full scripted with two characters, a mom and a daughter, and um, their mobile home is being repossessed with them inside of it, and so they're just being towed inside this eighty foot long mobile home while oh. they're just coming coming to a head with all their differences, and it's a dramedy. Um, even though it sounds pretty serious, um, but it, it's, um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, biggest budget I've ever been able to work with while still being modest, um, a modest budget. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, I'm so excited about all the team that came together for that. Oh, that's really cool. Um, so what's everyone else working on? Um, Andrea, what's your next project? I'm uh, I'm actually right now I'm doing uh, animation for a filmmaker who is um, it's a live action documentary um, about uh, I can't talk too much about it, I guess, because it's not finished, but it's about um, somebody who has inherited the BRCA2 um, breast cancer mutation. 
um, that uh, is, um, I guess it's inherited through uh, families. Um, specifically, this is of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. And I'm doing animation that shows um, how the inheritance is passed on from one generation to another. So it's actually a project. I do animation for other people often. And, uh, and yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. That's great. How about you, Catherine? Uh, I'm in post-production on a short film that I shot back in May, uh, and that uh, hopefully will be wrapping up in the next five to six weeks. Uh, and then I, uh, I'm working in development on another, uh, or I'm sorry, on a feature uh, with my partner, uh, which is uh, currently we're just getting, trying to get the funding for. Um, those are the two big ones. I have some smaller things that are all kind of development stuff, but uh, those are the those are the big ones. Shalise? Um, I always love and hate this question, just to be very transparent. <laughs> um, I'm not currently working on anything that I am directing. I am I work as a producer um, to make my living, and so I'm producing several of projects for other folks. Um, and I am really excited about a film that I'm um, producing on that hopefully will come out this next year um, called A Guide for When Immigrants Become Ancestors um, that I'm an EP on and um, by Ileana Garcia, who is our editor. It's a short film. Um, and I am also doing a lot of work around field building in the documentary fields um, in terms of um, really trying to support the move towards more um, care and human-centered work in our fields, um, more accountability, more um, resilience. And so that work is really exciting for me as well. Oh, that's fantastic. And how about you, Hunter? Um, I'm not really doing anything public creativity wise. Um, I'm just kind of living a normal, a regular life right now, but I'm always open to doing something new for yeah. sure. Has, has your life sure. changed since the film came out? Has anything is you know, sort of left it yeah. on a bit of a cliffhanger? So um, what's, what's happened since then? Yes, um, me, uh, I met Damien in person, um, and I'm actually, fingers crossed, I'm hoping to get his plane ticket tonight, and I was actually going to talk to Shalise about this later, um, but for him to come in November to Los Angeles, so I'm trying to, trying to get that together, I, I've never really done anything like that before, and he's never flown either, and so we're just trying to take it um, one step at a time, um, oh. yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. That's, you know, <laughs> we're kind of hoping that something like that would happen, but that's really, really fantastic news. Um, I just thank kind of you. want to end about, I'm sorry? Oh, uh, thank oh. you. Oh, um, I really want to end about like, you know, where do you see um, the future of women in filmmaking? Um, you know, what, what's happening with it? Have you seen change throughout your careers so far? And do you see it getting better um, as time progresses? Everyone, every, <laughs> do I need to just I call mean, somebody? Like, okay. I mean, I guess that's that's the hope. I do think so. Um, I think we're seeing, uh, you know, I'm in the process of trying to raise money, and you know, this process today is is a little bit, I wouldn't say easier, um, but there feels like there are more roads open to me now than there were maybe two or three years ago. Um, for whatever reason, and, and some of those reasons might not be solely, you know, to support women, but, you know, more to meet certain quotas, but I'll take it. Um, but I do think, yeah, I mean, I think with festivals like this and, and certain other festivals and also um, kind of the uh, inclusion of female filmmakers in more workshops and fellowships and uh, platforms, uh, especially, you know, since so much is online, I think that the doors are are inching open a little bit more. That said, there's still so much further that we need to go. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I have so many horror stories just from other friends, you know, in the business that are 
extremely mm -hmm. accomplished, um, award-winning, have incredible stories to tell and the skill to tell them perfectly and are still being overlooked. So it's, it's, um, it's both, you know, I'm optimistic, but also very cautiously so. Well, Sharon, do you have anything to say about that? I'll Sharon, are you open? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Sharon, do you want to say something? I don't know if she can hear. I don't know if she can hear. Oh, oh she's back. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear my name, but you could go, Shalise, since you're ready for it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I just will say that for anyone who's watching, who's listening, I mean, I think there's so much that we can do by um, making choices with what we watch, what we support. Um, you know, they're small moves, but there are so many filmmakers, you know, not only women filmmakers of color, queer filmmakers, filmmakers with disabilities, and many of these affinity groups that are also supporting and really organizing um, in so many of our communities to make films. And there's opportunities, even if you're not a studio exec or a funder to, to support, whether that be through crowdfunding, whether that be through really advocating, you know, choosing what you're, you know, what, what are you going to watch? What are you going to, to, to download on iTunes? Um, so I think um, I would, I, always encourage folks to to seek out stories that are maybe outside of what they're familiar with and and places um, like this and like Ludafest are a great place to start and there's so many more. Yeah, uh, and Hunter, are you starting to see, you know, more representation as well and just what you're seeing out there um, in, in films and, and uh, media? Definitely, ever since, I mean, 2013 is when I, I had was around the years when I was coming out the most, and from that point from and and to now, the rep the representation and diversity has just increased, and 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 that's the way it should be. It should be continuing that way, um, because as everyone says, it really does matter. Representation representation really does matter, and um, it should be seen more. Fantastic. And, and Sharon, did you want to? Um... Yes. Now I'm ready. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, no, it just, it reminded me that, you know, for When You Clean a Stranger's Home, we had a 99% uh, crew of female and non-binary uh, creators on this project, um, where I feel like 10 years ago, I would have really uh, struggled to make that happen. It was still quite a bit of a struggle, but um, some things that helped were that I had a grant from the city, and so I had a better budget to work with. And what I was finding was that when I would, um, when I was getting crew together, I would have a lot of uh, male filmmakers in the city offering me free labor. They're like, I will shoot the film. Like, I'm not even gonna charge you. I have equipment, all this stuff. Um, my uh, non-male filmmakers, they weren't in a place where they, you know, were working all these commercial gigs and had the ability to offer free labor. Um, so I was having to turn down free labor, but thanks to the grants that I had, I was able to pay these filmmakers that had been needing some kind of opportunity like this. So that was, um, that was a really great thing, but also in the process of hiring, it's like, um, with filmmaking, it's a lot about, uh, getting word of mouth recommendations. Cause you're trying to find people you can trust. And, um, as I was looking for, uh, for filmmaker recommendations, I would get the same like uh, uh, male, like white male uh, names being recommended, like the same ones that just circulate over and over and over. And um, so I was just like, surely somebody else is out there looking for work um, that isn't this one person. Um, and so I go to Instagram a lot and I, I look up hashtags like a uh, female composer or Latina composer, and I've been able to meet um, several collaborators that way. So sometimes it does cost a little extra money, and sometimes it does uh, take a little extra time to have to to go that extra mile. But um, other, if if we're not doing things like that, then we're not going to see change. So wow, you're doing that's that that is so great. You're really just lifting everyone up by actually doing that legwork to 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 find those people. So that uh, kudos. Yeah, that, and, that's how you do it. That's really it's because I I struggled finding entry points. So um, 
I want other people to be able to find them much more easily. Wow, amen. Um, and Andrea, um, do, do you have uh, anything you'd like to say about uh, women in the ministry at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And, um, and yeah, I just agree with what everybody has said. And I thought it was, it's, it's all so valuable. I think the one thing I would add is the just in bringing the more diversity we bring into filmmaking, um, the more perspectives we have and the more possibilities we have for the medium to grow. And there, there isn't just one way to tell a story. And I think that there tends to be this idea that there's like a dominant way to tell a story and, and it's, it's deeply entrenched in, um, I, th I think, uh, like sort of an, an older, more established, um, perhaps patriarchal way of telling stories. And when we break it open and allow more people in and have more possibilities of storytelling, I think we, we get a much richer pond of, um, of possibilities. And, and certainly with animation, one of the things I really love about it is that it's accessible. It's a really accessible art form. I could, anything that you saw in my film, I could teach, I could teach somebody in like 20 minutes. It's not difficult. And I think that it's just allowing for people to learn the tools and then taking those tools to storytelling and putting the stories out into the world. Wow, you guys are all incredible, and those and and your films just blew blew me away, and I know that they blew the audience away too because they were just fantastic, and your voices are just so strong and so interesting um, that you know we just hope that this kind of this continues, this momentum uh, continues, and we start to see these smaller but really important stories just appear everywhere. So thank you all for for joining us. Uh, thank you for being part of this. And again, um, wonderful, wonderful to hear your voices and so glad that you were able to join us tonight.